but this week we'll emphasize it as the next aspect of what ministry seems to be uh, talking to us about. So if we, we talked last week about uh, the introduction of the book, as Timothy is uh, the pastor in Ephesus, and um, there were some complications that arose. And so after a visit by Paul and Timothy, Timothy stays to pastor this church. And we might say then the fight began after leadership was in, uh, instituted. This we know uh, about the book, and I quote uh, Charles Swindoll. I thought I had a good introduction uh, to the second portion of Timothy. It says, by the time Paul wrote his second letter to Timothy, the young pastor had been ministering to the church at Ephesus for four years. Timothy had been a faithful servant to Paul since he had left home with the apostle more than a decade earlier. Timothy was not unfamiliar to the Ephesians when he settled in Ephesus to minister, having served there alongside Paul for a period of close to three years on Paul's third missionary journey. Paul wrote again to this young leader in the church at Ephesus to provide him encouragement and fortitude in the face of difficulties and trials. Paul wrote 2 Timothy from a dark and damp Roman prison cell just before his death in AD 67, the Roman Emperor Nero had been slowly descending into madness since his ascent to the throne in AD 54, a process exacerbated by the great fire of Rome in AD 64 that burned half the city. With the residents of Rome in an uproar, Christians became a convenient target for Nero, who used believers as scapegoats for his city's own lack of preparedness. Paul was one of those caught up in this persecution and was beheaded by Roman officials soon after writing this letter. So we could safely concern ourselves with this being the final words of the apostle. And that brings meaning to the text that we read, does it not? What we find in this book, then, is the lead into the fight. In uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1, it says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now today, the world doesn't understand the term bishop, but bishop, an elder, uh, pastor, shepherd, under-shepherd, those things all have the same meaning. They all refer to leadership within the church. Sometimes it's just about an older person. But sometimes there are discussions that lead us to understand that the eldership is a pastor. We don't believe in church rule by elders. We're not, uh, the classic form of that is, um, the word for elders is presbyteros. So guess what? Faith really believes in elder ruled churches. And that would be Presbyterian. Uh, okay, uh, but that is by far the church government within most of the Protestant denomination. Those that don't believe that believe in some sort of hierarchy in ruling of the church, and that would get into mostly the Catholic faith and some that are uh, aligned with what's called the apostolic movement. Both believe that there is a furtherance of the apostolic gift and position even to our world today. So that uh, Catholics believe that the Pope sits on uh, in a seat that was left to him uh, by the apostles. And so uh, Peter, to, to be specific, and uh, they have cardinals and bishops and or however that lineage, lineage goes, but there is a hierarchy that rules the church. The average church member has little to say about the government of his church. We believe in the independency, and the, if we might use the term theocracy, we believe that uh, we are governed by God. God is our one and true head, and that there are no subcategories of leadership in authority. 
there are positions mentioned, and we're talking about them today, particularly ordained positions, that position being one that we commonly call a pastor, and the other one we commonly call deacon. And uh, these are appointed and uh, seem to be the only uh, structure in the church that has uh, leadership. The church itself is governed, as we said, by God. Every church member uh, has an equal uh, vote. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is rumored to have visited a Baptist church, and after having been asked about it, having sent through a business meeting, said that, I have determined that this is a great model, even for our United States. So uh, Thomas Jefferson may have uh, thought Baptist churches, are, which are democratic, uh, would be the way to rule a republic uh, such as we have. How does one become a preacher, a pastor? It's by a God-given desire. He who desires the office. This is not desiring in the same way that someone would select to be a uh, auto mechanic or uh, any other trade or skill in the world. This is not something that should come to us because we desire it uh, as a way of life. I have a few times in my life Wondered if this is a calling I cannot turn back the clock on. Uh, times I didn't feel like this is what I wanted to be. But I have never yet to this point in my life felt that it was not a part or a calling to be. I would say it's God-given and it is closer to what we might call a compulsion that you feel. I resisted it. Uh, occasionally still resist it and sometimes don't understand it and wonder why in the world the Lord would ever call me into ministry. But it refers to this internal feeling that we have and there is no other way to say it than feeling because there's really nothing else to go on. Uh, there's nothing, I didn't get a check, you know, letter in the mail said, yep, you've been selected and uh, such things as that. Overseers, which are uh, the same terminology actually as shepherd, an under-shepherd, were also called elders, shepherds, pastors, or bishops, all having to do the same essential task. They were and are now the leaders in each church. And say leader or leaders, most churches have one or two uh, of these positions we're going to talk about today, and perhaps more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says this about uh, the matter, verses 26 through 31. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, nor many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord. So first of all, in ministry, we should be realistic about it. Uh, why in the world would God use me, and how can he use me? I bet, there's, uh, Karen and I were just uh, recently talking about this, how that if there's anything that has affected me in ministry through the years, it's been self-esteem. Uh, I can't do this. Um, why... They need somebody different than me, and all those thoughts. And those may be true at certain times, and the, I believe that there are people that are more adept at certain things than others. I know pastors that are, by their very nature, uh, they just came into this world as evangelists, and others that have natural speaking abilities. Some, I just said, you know, 
sometimes I just hear a tape of myself and I'm going, Dad, I'm so sorry for y'all that have to listen to me. Uh, I'm going to keep talking, but, uh, you know, I wish I had a better voice. I wish I sounded differently. There are times when, you know, I hear somebody that will talk and has an English or an Australian accent or something. I go, that is so cool. I wish I could talk like that. And then uh, sometimes you think, well, it should be Southern because that's, you know, you're just not a preacher unless you have a Southern drawl, you know, to that's not. I used to know a man, a good friend of mine, pastored for a while in Wyoming, and he taught, I called him Gomer. That's not his name, and so don't think of this, but you, anybody that has never known Gomer Pyle and heard him talk on all those television shows then heard him sing a, a song, said, what happened to Gomer? You know, uh, he sings the dream, the impossible dream. It's a different person. Yep, and that's the way that person was. He turned on the preacher in the pulpit, but otherwise it sounded like Gomer Pyle. And uh, used to make us laugh a little bit, but he felt that just how he was. I'm not sure. He was not long in the ministry before he said he was done with it. So maybe that's part of it. He was trying for the show and didn't make the, the show too often. We lead into the fight by saying pastors are the frontline defense to keep doctrinal purity in the Lord's churches. Uh, not that I'm the answer to all things, but that if there's anything that comes into the church, I should be the first to, to spot it, among the first to spot it, and understand what's going on in our world. I listen to stuff all over the radio. I read all kinds of things. And the reason I do that, I even read things from other faiths. Oh no, my goodness. Uh, because I want to have an understanding of what's the problem in the world today. The reason I do that is I hope that that benefits this church, that we can be aware of the things that are going on and what might be the next attack that would come against us. Pastors are trained to properly know and use the God-breathed Word of God. Because that's what inspired means, right? It was breathed by God into those writers. And that training comes from home and church. Timothy is a, a seasoned professional, if you will. Not because he went to seminary, but because his grandmother and mother taught him. And Paul uh, understands that. And seminary, a more modern thing, is a good thing. And I would encourage any young minister to attend it. Would have saved a lot of uh, time in my life had I put that all into a more packaged uh, way of doing it. But I had a pastor when I was first saved that was almost anti-seminary because at that time a lot of our seminaries were teaching things and uh, he thought were too liberal you know, in theology. Come to find out, uh, it's still good to get the training. And you know this, I know this, but pastors are all flawed human men, but not actively instigating error. That has more of an application when we read about the calling. And this is it. This is the, what we have as an outline of what you should expect from pastoral ministry in this church or any one of the Lord's churches. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not guilty of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Over he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now these are how that falls into. And what I said, he's flawless, he, he's not flawless, but he shouldn't be instigating error. It's kind of funny because the word reproach comes from, uh, or is transported uh, blameless from a Greek word that means to not be arrested. <laughs> it 
So I haven't been arrested, so it's good. I can remain your pastor. It's really hard to pastor once you're in prison. And I have heard people talk about that, and isn't it ironic that these very words are being written by the pastor of pastors from a prison a cell, a Roman prison cell. Of course, the understanding of blameless is what really falls into that. You're not going to be, if you're not, you might be falsely accused, but there's real, there's no real evidence that you did anything. Uh, and so by implication, you're blameless, unrebukable. It says, and I'm going, you know, I don't think I'm that controversial anymore, but uh, more and more, uh, understand this as I do, and that is that um, it has to, that this position is a position for men, a male. Some take the implication that you have to be a husband, that you have to be married, but I take the understanding to be if you are a husband, then his wife is the one and only. At a time period when plural marriages were acceptable, he is not supposed to be that way. Uh, Brother Counts and I, uh, just at our last associational meeting, ha- had a discussion about this, and he agrees with me that um, the, the phrase really has to mean one woman man. You're a one woman man. It means that you're sold out to your spouse, and not another. You're not chasing women. You're uh, not a womanizer. These have to be understood in individual terms. But um, I know a man that uh, came from a Mormon background, had several wives, and accepted Jesus Christ, got saved, and then had to make a decision about what he was going to do with a plural wife household. Now, you can imagine that that was not something solved simply. Uh, But it was, nevertheless, solved, but not to everyone's uh, satisfaction. And so some... Never thought, thought that he should never have been in ministry because he had previous wives. And uh, uh, Brother Counts uh, knew that man that, as I did and knew that he desired, felt called to the ministry. And Brother Counts, I think, well as others have told me, he said, is there anything on this list that God cannot forgive? Because if there is, Is this the one and only thing that God cannot forgive? And if it is, then why take the time for the whole list? And why take the time to understand that we are none, that none who fill the office of pastor are flawless, and that probably we have all committed all the things and have needed every single thing on this list at some time or another? Because he said what this means as much as anything is he says if I have a transient thought of another woman, at that moment I'm not a one-woman man. And that at that moment breaks the privilege. And if that becomes a lifestyle, then there's a problem. But any of these things can be a problem to any minister at any time. Sober-minded, which means, you know, are they vigilant? Are they awake? Not as in sober as in drinking, but drinking paints the picture of somebody that's not quite all there. Uh, They need to be vigilant. This could mean that there's a time in my life when I would not have the mental capacity to, to do this work. And we have to be honest about it that when you can't do it, Uh, because there's something that stands in your way, then probably it's time to to step aside. Self-controlled. Another indication of what happens when we're talking about being sober. We don't associate control with somebody who has a drinking problem. Uh, We think of this as somebody that can, their life, control things. I struggle with this. I struggle with it because of how I look at myself or how I see myself in a mirror or body image. Uh, Many of us deal with that. 
if you've ever been to a meeting, we go to, uh, used to have a pastor, a uh, pastor that was my, uh, my pastor when I was in mission work, and pastor our sponsoring church, had a real problem with this, and uh, encouraged me to, uh, you know, get in shape, and would often make a point out, he says, uh, look at the, look at the audience we have today of all those pastors, how many calories do you think we're going to consume at lunch today, you know, uh, down at the uh, buffet, and uh, he had a real problem with that, and it's something I didn't, I probably didn't appreciate about that man as much as uh, I could about other things, and, uh, he, but he was fixated on that thing, control yourself, respectable or of good behavior. You know, you carry respect and there's ways that this happens in our world. And uh, if they're just not respectable in their day-to-day uh, comings and goings as implied in elsewhere in this list, then uh, we should be uh, thinking about them. We call this GTH, given to hospitality. Uh, there's times and seasons that any man in the ministry may be called upon to be hospitable, uh, open his house, open the doors of his home uh, for uh, helping those in church. It has come to the point, at least once in my life, uh, twice I should say, once to help a young man that uh, I was working with and we gave him a place to stay for a while while he was uh, getting his life together. A couple that had been evicted due to circumstances that uh, they were fighting and could not take care of, they ended up homeless and uh, ended up living with uh, me and my wife at the time uh, for an extended period of time. In fact, up to the time when I moved away from Colorado to Washington State, we were able to get them into the house that we occupied. And uh, you never know, but GTH, when if you ever hear that term, that's what it means in the McFarland household, apt to teach. Not only saying you've been trained to teach, but that uh, you desire to do it, that you have a, uh, you want to stand before people and talk about the Word of God. And uh, it's, it's a right thing. Uh, you wouldn't want to have a pastor that says, you know, I, really, I want to be your pastor, but I, I really don't want to teach anything. I really don't want to be in front of you. And so I'll just write notes. Uh, that, of course, would be, crazy. Not given to wine. The deacons are also got given, it says too much wine. Uh, well, given to is the key here, because a common drink of the time was essentially what we would call Welch's grape juice. Uh, it's a common drink, uh, not formulated to be an alcoholic beverage, although there were people that did that. But the idea that your, your addiction would be another way to put this, I guess, that, uh, that was your preference. You know, most people at the time that this was written uh, appreciated decent water. It was not easy to come by. Uh, and so they drank um, juices that came from a variety of sources. And that variety of sources, whether it's... Uh, Apples or, or grapes or whatever it came from uh, provided resources for drinking. You can't get away from the fact that from the moment you squeeze grape juice, uh, a fermentation process is beginning. Guaranteed, the beautiful purple Welch's grape juice that you have in your refrigerator, if you let it set long enough, it will not be the same in time. Not violent, not a striker, not looking for a fight, uh, which is kind of like verse uh, uh, the eleventh point here. Not quarrelsome or a brawler. Um, I was te- I think I've told the story before. I was teased about this in Utah because um, I actually had um, hadn't been there very long, and uh, a guy forced me to take a swing at him in order to protect myself. And uh, so I was teased for a while because uh, that happened uh, when I first got there. But not looking for a fight, either way, for a physical fight or just to be quarrelsome. Gentle, 
in the middle of all of that. Patient. Um, are we patient? I'm pretty patient. Um, most of the time, I think I am. Yeah, in my own mind, I'm very patient. Uh, but, of, of course, who knows this about us as those we are around. I'm patient on some things, not patient with other things. I bet you're the same way. You know, nobody wants to watch a religious movie with me because my mouth gets to going. Other things that I may have interest in, I can talk about forever. And the thing that you're talking about, I may not be patient with that. My wife and I have different ways of explaining things. I explain things in outline form. She explains them in small no novellas. So there are differences in ways of, of doing things like that, and we have to be patient with all those, those sorts of ways of uh, means with us. Not a lover of money or covetous. I would love to have some money, but I don't always have to be loving and thinking about it. Although there are days, and I think that any of us ought to be real, if you get to a place where this becomes a preoccupation, then that's the problem. And uh, it's always been a problem, always will be a problem in churches to talk about this. It's more problematic in a small church, always has been, always will be, that how we spend our money and what we spend our money on. I had a family member, uh, a grandfather buried marriage, that thought that... Uh, Preachers, uh, he couldn't understand us getting paid for anything. We only worked a couple hours a week, so uh, why would we need pay for that? Of course, he didn't understand that it requires, you know, about uh, 8 to 12 hours for me to develop a particular sermon. That's about what I spend uh, each week on what you hear from the pulpit, and, uh, or more, if our, there are other lessons. But uh, nevertheless... Um, we also shouldn't think that we need everything that somebody else has. A man who manages, manages his household with respect. The understanding that you have your house in order and it's in subjection doesn't mean that you do that by severity. This is not a talk about severe actions, and yet how many times have you seen a preacher in a movie that is just absolutely unbearable to live with? And uh, this is a misunderstanding that comes with that. The actual underlying understanding is that uh, you rule your household with respect. Can you demand respect? Sometimes we think that. And sometimes we get that because it depends where you're at. If I'm in the military, I think I'm going to be demanded to respect the officer up line from me, no matter who's in that position, but because of the stripes uh, on that uh, shirt. I feel a little bit like this on our political offices. I don't necessarily have to agree uh, with anybody in office, but I can respect the position. You know, I right now I'm the guy that's in the that's the president of this uh, this country. It's not my vote. Doesn't vote for him. Uh, not my favorite person. But if he came, if it came a time for me to, and I could go visit him in the White House, would I turn down? going and, and shaking hands with the president, I would not. I would, I, would inc I would be looking forward to that and find that a great thing to do. Um, not a recent convert, not a novice, uh, meaning that uh, you just didn't call, get called a priest yesterday and today and tomorrow you will be able to uh, be adequate in the work of pastor. Um, this is why quite often in New Testament churches there are multiplicity of elders uh, as this became the way the, the training took place. Has a good reputation with those outside of the church. You certainly should be cautious of anybody when they come knocking on the church door and say, is so-and-so your pastor? Yes, well, we're here with a warrant, you know. That goes back to number one, right? Blameless. Uh, if they've got something on me and it's worth uh, me going to jail, uh, you, probably, you guys probably want to talk to me about that following that. How about other ministers and servants of the church? Uh, ver chapter 3, verse 8 through 13 says this, and I highlighted it there on your slide, likewise must the, de the deacons. The deacons in this respect are talking about a certain office. 
the word deacon uh, talks about being a servant, literally a server as serving tables. But it says be grave, not in the grave, be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let those also first be proved, and let them all use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, a great boldness of, in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So there are uh, things that, that go along with that. Well, did I, did I, yeah, it shows there. So what do deacons do anyway? Okay, so I'm going to give the next uh, half hour to Brother Bob. He's going to tell us. And somebody would say, some churches, they do everything, and some churches, not much. Why have them? Do we, I hope we all have the understanding that God never said, thou shalt appoint and ordain deacons. This office is approved of God because it is in the scripture and it was necessary, but these, this is the early church saying, here is a need we have in our church, and this is how we're going to take care of it. Acts, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmur of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, is it not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? There, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. There's a whole sermon that uh, is contained in this. One of those things is that... If uh, the apostles were so high and mighty, how come they're even concerned about the multitude of disciples? They call the multitude together. It's because it's a church. They call it a church meeting. It's a church business meeting. And they say, pick you, you pick out among yourselves seven, and we'll get them going on this. We'd like to spend more time in the Word. And they didn't even have a Bible. They didn't have PowerPoint. They didn't have a projection screen. They didn't even have a good Nelson King James version of the Bible. What are they doing? Well, they're doing the same thing. They're praying and letting God work out all of this. They're preaching from the Old Testament. Remember? That, that was pretty well established by then. The early church, as far as the Bible's concerned, had the Old Testament. Here are those things that are in that list. They were seeing that widows were neglected. So there is a socioeconomic and logistical need that was not being met as expected. People weren't getting the food. People weren't being cared for as they should have. And what was the problem that the apostles had? They leave the word of God and serve tables. Spiritual leadership was being used for common needs. They were to be men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Men were available to diacono, be a servant, an attendant. And in verse, uh, chapter 6 and verse 6 of Acts that we were talking about, they lay their hands on them, which is to set them apart, to be ordained. That laying on of hands is not a great spiritual thing, you know. That's not, I remember that moment when I was ordained. Probably, Bob probably remembers that too. I got a little wisdom. I don't know that I remember much about what people told me. 
uh, but it was a setting apart. It symbolized that we were to be in a place that uh, God would use us for service. Giving them continually to prayer, to the ministry of the word, pastors could focus on the spiritual and deacons the material. Now, is that perfectly how um, we define it? Well, of course, this is that list. Uh, Deacons are going to do whatever the church tells them to do. There's not an exact list. We're not exactly serving tables. We're not living in a communal pattern that the early church did. But in those people that will serve the church, and there can be more than one, even in small churches, uh, this individual is grave, dignified. That means that the way their character is 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 that they're not seen as a foolish person. Not double-tongued, they're sincere. You can count on what they tell you. Uh, Given to much wine, uh, same words are said. We're going to say whatever I just said about the pastor and wine still applies here to deacons. They're not greedy for dishonest gain. They're not in it to make some money. Oh, as a deacon, I'm going to make some money. Uh, If anybody was going to figure that out, some deacons would have by now. And if they did, uh, they didn't stay around very long. Holding the mystery of the faith and pure conscience. Understand, they have a great respect for God's word, what they know and what they don't yet know. The mystery of God's word is still in effect. I still learn. I don't know it all, and neither does anybody else. But a deacon is somebody that... Uh, serving the church, they have a great respect for this mystery of the faith that we live in. Uh, The testing that comes along with that is the proving. And so this goes along with the same thing. This is not an individual that last couple days ago got saved and you want them to be a deacon. They're going to be observed in your church for a period of time and will have proved that they are worthy of that. Blameless, same word, same understanding. They're not arrested. They're not in jail. You know, we haven't, get, had, we haven't had to go down and get Brother Bob out of, you know, pay his bail and get him out. And that's good for him. And I'm sure Sister Regina would say that's good for her too. Wife who is dignified and faithful. I'm going to say that that's something we observe as well. A man, a pastor, or a deacon can be removed from the office because of the actions of their family, and sometimes by the actions of a wife. In fact, there are some people who, because of my wife and know the situation, I say this, and everybody in public knows it, my wife, who's married to me, uh, is not, has had uh, other marriages. She's been divorced. There are people in our work. There are people within the more fundamentalist Baptist work, some of whom are in our area, would say that um, I should not be connected with her, that that causes my ministry to be compromised. Um, I say this. Can God forgive anything? And can we get past all those things? Uh, I've done it in my household. You count how I rule my household, not by how Karen has been ruled in any other household. Uh, That's not up for judgment here. You judge me, and you do judge me, and I understand that, um, by how things are in my household. And one woman, husband, that means a woman at a time, It doesn't mean that uh, someone that has been divorced cannot ever be a deacon. It must be taken on a case-to-case basis. But the idea is is that you're dedicated to your wife and your wife only. Not other women in the church. Not other women in the community. Not past ones or ones you're looking for in the future. Um, Get over it. Get dedicated to your wife. Manage children and household well. And this is something a lot of people struggle with. The joke 
that I've heard ever since I've been in the church has been that the pastor's kids and sometimes the deacon's kids were the worst in the church. And that has some merit as the joke would not be a joke otherwise. There are some men who have so committed themselves to the Lord's church that they let their own homes go mismanaged. It shouldn't happen in a pastor's life or a deacon's life. The church abounds in servants. Many men and women are servants in church without being ordained. The example is Phoebe, who uh, is a servant in the church. It's mentioned in Romans 16.1. But this is what we also know. Not for deacons or any of these is there a time period mentioned. How long did they do this? How long did the seven serve in Jerusalem? A great many say, once the job was managed well, maybe it only took a couple of them to keep this work up, and the other five or six went on to do something else. Um, work other than to the widows is not exact, as we said, so we need somebody to help with the widows. That's why we need deacons. It doesn't say anything about windows or air conditioning or parking lot or mowing the grass or anything else that sometimes are allotted to uh, the deacons. And churches can find great many ways to use deacons in ways that I don't know that they were ever intended to be used. But if the church is okay with it and the individual, then so be it. It is, I want to emphasize, is a buck stops here, get her done position. So, this is not a hand-me-down committee that talks a lot but doesn't do anything. Pastors or deacons are really in the same thing. Once it's something that is perceived, we should do something about getting it done. I confess that that's been a problem with me and that uh, I beg your forgiveness for not always following through what I've committed to do. We always have to do that. Every one of us, anybody that takes on a task for the church should be able to complete it. Do what the church has asked you to do to the best of your ability. And uh, if you can't do it, or there are mistakes or whatever, the church will forgive and get over it. But we do want you to commit to do what you can and do it. It does not remove others from doing the same or similar work. I have seen people get upset. Well, the church asked me to do it, yet so-and-so over there, they're doing it. Well, what right do they have to do it? Well, because maybe God's opened the door for them to help with it. We're talking about things like air conditioning and different things that happens in a practical church's life. You know, if you know a where we can get a good deal and get air conditioning put in cheap, I think we'll all be willing to listen to that. But there is somebody we've put in place to try and track that down. But we're all looking for a good deal, right, when it comes to something practical as that. Mature men and women mentor so that the deacon may have little to do. 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 through 25, is a whole section about Men and women who are of age teach the younger. Every church, as it begins to grow and has a place to do it, uh, becomes a place of mentoring. That's why we have men's meetings. That's why we have women's fellowships and those sorts of things. Not because we're needing to be isolated, but it's the need to teach young men and young women uh, about growing up in church. And those meetings are great for that. Less important when we don't have a lot of youth. But we're hoping that that will change. And there could be an aspect then that could lead us to have more time for mentoring. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 20 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Then that sin rebuked before all, that others may also fear. 
Here is pastoral eldership. Multiple pastors was the norm. Just having one pastor is something that's more of our generation in the last hundred, a couple hundred years than in the full life of the church. It's always been that there are uh, others in that office as well. It just is. Are all compensated? No. The compensation is particularly important for who? Especially they who labor in word and doctrine. The church doesn't have to feel compelled to have a paid ministry. But if you're going to pay anybody, you're going to pay the one that labors before you in the word that delivers the word to you, teaches the doctrine. We would probably call this today the senior pastor, uh, <coughs> as much as anything else in current lingo. And that this is important. You expect them to labor for you, but you don't want them to be able to live what you give from them. I know, and this is something that all churches deal with, they deal with the guilt of it, and the pastors deal with the guilt of trying to get them to do it. It's my job to tell you that you should be working on compensating me so that I don't have to have a secular job. It is your desire that we would grow and expand and that at some point you could compensate me for not, and not having to work out in the community. Is that a requirement? No. It's a condition of the heart, and it's something that we all desire. I can see and would desire that, uh, and it comes along with something that's called old age and retirement and Social Security. <laughs> the Lord is actually opening some doors for me to be less involved out in the community. But that's the United States government that's helping along with that a little bit. What do we need? There's no way around it. This church must grow. We must add members to this church in order to be able to financially do what we want to do. But please, don't carry any guilt. I don't carry any guilt for asking for funds, and I don't carry any guilt for the fact that the capacity to do it isn't there. We just know that it's something that could be and that it's something in Scripture. Personality conflicts, they should be avoided, and that's why there's good to have two or three witnesses. Brother Gary told me the other day, and I think this is a problem. All right, that's great. You want to bring that before the church? Okay. It would be best, though, that this is done uh, with some supporting evidence. It's also best to know that for a minister, you're not hid from problems in your life. And uh, I have at least one memory of an individual who had trouble with their children and the church setting them down and say, what are we going to do about your kids? And that individual uh, having a hard time hearing it. Well, that rebuke has even affected me. I was in the ministry at the time, and among all, I realized, oh, pastors can get in trouble with the church too. Yep, they can. And we should understand that. Pastoral sin is not to be hidden. And uh, this is something we should be aware of. If we had several, uh, that they would know that we don't hide things. Do we not see this happening in a large religious institution in our world today? where they have hid the sins of their ministers uh, for years, and it's now become public, and there is great harm been done by religious people who try to cover up for one another. It should be, shouldn't be done. Yes, there's a level of internal uh, struggle and such that takes care, that can take place, and that can be resolved. But uh, there's been some lack of discipline in that organization, for sure. Fight the good fight, then, therefore, uh, chapter 6, verses 11 through 12, that tell us that, you know, a man of God, flee these things and follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. What's a good versus a bad fight? 
It's about what the fight is about. I have fights all the time. Karen and I have disagreements often. And when they're of a nature to be dispelled, that's where they die. It can be the tone of voice. It can be anything, a misunderstanding or whatever. Is it really that this is what you want to fight about? I've said this to parents in counseling for years. You know, uh, wh what is it that you want to get across and work with with your child? Is it about really about the, a relationship or is it about how they clean the room? What fight do you want to fight for? Fighting for the faith is different than fighting about the faith. I may be called to debate anybody in this church about some issue, but I'd rather not. I'd rather not to go, have to go to meetings and look for a spiritual fight in everything. My first pastor in this work, I felt that's kind of what happened. Every time we went to a meeting, uh, it seemed like he was always looking for a fight. We were the only church in the whole world that seemed like we were standing for the truth. Come to find out, we have thousands of churches all fighting similar battles. And there was no reason to go to every meeting, every fellowship, and not get fellowship. Looking, you know, we didn't have many friends. Why? Because they didn't want to be around churches that fought all the time. We should be the same. Is it something worth taking a stand on? Then stand for it. Otherwise, stay out of church, other churches' business and let them do what they will do, uh, whether we like it or not. It's up to them because they're... The head of that church is the same as ours. Let them worry about that with God. We'll worry about our church. Unless it's something that directly affects us. Timothy 3, 10 through 11 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Paul says, You know what I believe. You know what you ought to believe. You know the doctrine. What are you going to do? Then put that, that's what you do. That's a good fight. The greater fight is for the faith, not for an opinion, not for a tradition. I've heard of it. You probably have too. Churches have split over how to paint, what color to paint the nursery. That's crazy. But if they're talking about the plan of salvation and some don't have an understanding of it, then that's where we stand. We'll, we'll draw that line. Make it about the faith. And it's not that things are going to get easier, is it? Even there, we read on in these verses, yea, there's going to be some suffer persecution. And there's some that are going to not understand this in time. Too bad. Verse 14. So what do you do? Continue. You know the faith. Continue. And this, of course, is where we are today. So we win. And how do we win? It's simply. I can summarize. I have more slides that need to be showed today, but let's summarize it on this. If we continue, we win. Keep on keeping on. Keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Paul simply says, I have fought a good fight. I thought that's interesting wording. I have fought a good fight. He didn't fought all the fights there are to fight in the world. He's fought his course. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He uses the terminology as a runner would. I have struggled with my race that I'm running, but I see the finish line. I'm finishing my course. I have kept the faith. And what's at the end of the race? A crown. You don't get the accolade without finishing the course. And a great many of us today need to understand that what Paul was referring to as much as anything is, is that what his legacy would be. Does Paul have a legacy that still stands to today? It does. Do you have a legacy? What are you going to leave behind? What are you going to do? Will they know you as someone that got out of a fight any time they could, but they needed to have a fight? 
that cut the course short, didn't play by the rules, or who in the end didn't really keep the faith. Is that the legacy you want? Paul's legacy is mighty. I can't wait to shake that man's spiritual hand one of these days in glory. I am what I am today, not because of Timothy, but because of Paul telling Timothy what a young minister ought to be doing. It has helped me. It has helped churches. It gives us guidance. And Paul left that as a legacy. I'm out of here. I'm going to be gone pretty soon. I know my time is short. You know the doctrine. Continue. You win. You win by finishing the course. Don't cut it short. And the course can be tedious and long and hard. But leave a legacy of faith. Leave behind what no man can cause a problem to be generated from. As a minister, do your job. Be the best you can. Do what you can do. Improve yourself. As a deacon, do what you're called to do. Do what the church asks you to do. And do it in understanding that's your legacy. And all of us that serve the church in whatever way we do, our legacy is to finish the course. Um, fight the fight that needs to be fought. Not every fight in the world just the fight that needs to happen now. Finish the course. Not all the courses in the world. Race car drivers drive one course at a time. They've got to finish that course. They've got to complete the number of laps that they've been asked to do. And when the checkered flag falls and they're the first place, they get a reward. But so does a lot of other people nowadays. The last person in the Indianapolis 500 I believe this year won something like 50 some thousand dollars. I can drive around once and in last. But that's not what I would want to do. I would want to have the Borg Warner trophy sitting in my house for having won that. Finish the course. Keep the faith. And understand there's a crown coming. And you can't get that crown until you finish. I'm looking for the crown of life that's coming when we get out of here. There's a reward coming. I'm not asking for it today. But I am anticipating it. I'm living my life understanding that the course is there. The finish line's in sight. And I know what happens after I get to the end of it. I'm rewarded. I'm not rewarded with eternal life. I have that. That's a part of my being. But I have at the end of that an individual who's standing at the finish line who one day I hope will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm running the race not for my wife. I love her. I'm not running this race for my son. I love him. I'm not running this race because of this church. I love this church and everyone in it. I am running the race I run because at the end of this race is the one who loves me most, who gave their life for me and will crown me when I cross that line. I'm anxious, if not in a hurry. And if that's not what you're looking for, I'm sorry. But that's what you get when you cross the line. Today, in all the aspects of life, it's not just ministry, as I pointed out already. I hope you saw that, that this whole list of stuff about ministers, about pastors and deacons, isn't just about them. Everybody has the same expectations. Every man in this church is to be a one-woman man. Everything that has been asked of us is no different than anybody else in the church. We all live by the same list. It's just that it makes for a quick questionnaire, <laughs> if nothing else. But uh, today, 
Is there a legacy to be left? Yeah. And let's leave it. <laughs>